Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you a path towards a healthier life and maybe a future without COVID. Could it really happen? Well, we're going to talk about that today, right, Dr. Trin? Yeah, good to see you guys. Can you hear me okay? Is the volume all right? Sounds good. Sounds good. So we, right. th- this is an amazing episode on so many levels. Let me see if I can set up some of my amazing, uh, if I can Where's lay your up. voice? I can barely hear you. You can barely hear me? <laughs> yeah. How do I sound now? A little bit better. A little bit better because, yeah, that looks fine. It, it may be just the volume on your end. Oh, but possibly. Let me see. Okay, I'm turning up my volume. Yeah, see if that sounds any better. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah. Sounds great now. Okay. All right. So here's what I'm amazed about this. Morning. I'm always amazed at the people you find to bring on this show. But this one's amazing on a couple levels because you're always bringing in kids who've worked with you in high school and your tongue out programs and other sorts of things. And I'm always saying today, our, our general assumption is kids are, you know, lazy. They're millennials. They're uh, into video games. They're just wasting time. Why don't they get with it and save the world? They're not politically active. Why aren't they marching? Why aren't they doing something? I want, we want youth to, to be, and yet you bring in these kids that are saving the planet uh, and solving world issues. And here's another high school student today who's decided to tackle on her spare time, I guess, COVID and COVID research, right? Welcome Kate Chang to the show here. Oh, on her spare time, she published five papers. <laughs> yeah, but she's in high school. She's in high school. Wait, are you a junior or a senior? I'm a junior. Oh, okay. One more year. One more year. <laughs> yeah, right. When I was a junior in high school, all I wanted to do was, you know, party and have a good time and watch TV and eat Cheetos. Uh, I wasn't thinking of solving the world. Uh, but she comes by this. She has a good pedigree, as they say. She has a good uh, mentor and inspiration because her father's been a guest in the show. Set it up, Dr. Trin. Who are we talking to today here? All right. Well, Kate is amazing, obviously. A junior in high school. I was playing video games as a junior in high yeah, school. We all but were. She, but, but her name is on five published journals, uh, medical journals. And, uh, and she knows more science than 99.9% of those that I, uh, that I have met. Um, uh, she, she reads articles and she's like, oh, she totally understands it. I'm like, totally oh, understands it. Well, but the, this, this didn't fall out of the sky. Uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Your doctor, your, uh, your father is who? Who's your father that you, that's helping you with this stuff here? Uh, my father, so thank you very much for having me on the show and giving me the opportunity to speak. Also, thank you very much for the kind words. My father is a clinical professor of medicine at UCI, and he already has two FDA-approved drugs for anemia. So both my parents are physicians, so I always knew that medicine would be my path. But I didn't really know how I would go about my path towards becoming a physician until uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Okay. And your father's been on the show before, I I believe, right, Dr. Trim? We've had him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, uh, so... You know what you want to do already as a junior in high school. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's laudable. That's applaudable because so many of us are still struggling when we go through high school and college and everything, wandering, trying to find the path. Is it over here? Is it over here? And we try this and it doesn't go anywhere. You seem to have a pretty clear path. Um, do you think that obviously though, your parents are successful and, and, and did they imbue you with this clear path or did you just see them and say, I want to do that? Was this them pushing you in a direction or you following in a direction? It's quite surprising because my parents did not push me at all towards medicine. They just said they wanted me to be happy and pursue any path or career that uh, was passionate to me. But um, I always thought that medicine was really enjoyable. 
and I thought it was just fascinating. Science has always been my passion. So since both my both my parents were uh, are physicians, I decided to look more into medicine and realized how much it resonated with me. But let's re- talk to the reality here. You're a junior in high school. So what the heck are you doing? How do you even get your name on the thing? Is this in conjunction with your father or are you doing this on your own or a combination? I mean, how does a junior in high school get that kind of recognition? You have to spend years in these fields before they'll even consider publishing your papers. So it's most interesting. My father, he's the one who um, initially discovered this potential treatment for COVID. So he realized early in the pandemic that the immune response to COVID-19 would be the major factor in fighting off the virus. When COVID-19 first comes to the body, right, the body produces something called interferons to fight off the virus. Okay. A particular interferon that get that uh, makes the viral load or viral replication less is called interferon lambda. Okay. It is like the security guard of the body. Yep. Dr. Trin always says it's the little troops guarding the castle here. You know. Right, right. So yep. instead of blocking the intruder um, when it's already upstairs, you want to block it at the entrance. This interferon lambda response is like blocking the virus from coming in at the entrance. But most fascinating is that co- the COVID-19 virus actually completely suppresses this interferon lambda response in the nose and the throat. Hmm. As a result, the virus is able to replicate in the nose and throat and come down into the lungs. So my father realized that we should boost this interferon lambda response, thereby preventing the virus from replicating. And this is especially relevant considering that new strains of virus are able to spread more rapidly and replicate a lot more, like Omicron. So if we can boost the interferon lambda response, no matter the variant, we would be able to contain the spread. So my father went on and uh, he discovered rematriban. Rematriban is a drug that has been used for the treatment of allergies for the last 20 years in Japan. And he realized that rematriban has the potential to boost the immune response against the virus. Later on, it also turns out that COVID-19 causes blood clotting. Blood clotting, especially in the lungs, can prevent proper transfusion of oxygen into the blood and delivery of oxygen to the rest of the body. Blood clotting can also cause um, organ damage, uh, uh, especially to vital organs such as the heart and the brain. So it is essential that we prevent blood clotting. Interestingly, this drug rematriban also prevents blood clotting. So it was a perfect situation and this drug um, has great potential in COVID. So really my journey began when my father asked me to create a figure for him to demonstrate this concept. On my own, I thought it was, I was, I thought it was so fascinating. I wanted to, I I guess stop you for one second. So you Mm -hmm. create a figure. What does that mean? I don't know what that is. That a computer model? Is that a, uh, is that a, uh, profile? Is that a, yeah, I I don't know what you say. Create a figure is. So a figure is like an image to demonstrate the concept. So a lot of, uh, a lot of research papers, they have figures and images to show the pathway uh, from going from one to the next. So it's like so, a drawing. It's an actual okay, kind of a drawing. Right. Okay. All right. Right. Infographic. It's like an infographic. There you go. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got right. it. Okay. Yeah. So he said to you, hey, I'm doing this research. Can you just help me flesh out this paper and create some some drawings and some diagrams right. and some infographics to demonstrate this? Mm-hmm. You know, in a way he figured that... I was the brand new generation, so I can use the computer. Computer. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Every kid just knows how to do this. You're right. a kid. Automatic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then, so you uh, he brought you in, it, and, and this is going to be in a research paper. He's going to put your drawings, your images, your figures into his paper if he likes them. Right. Yeah. And on my own time, I decided to jump into the science because when he first drew out the figure, I just did not understand anything. Mm -hmm. I was at the time where I really loved science, but 
I did not really understand medicine or these signaling pathways. I didn't even know what drug development was. I was, oh. uh, yeah, I was completely ignorant to this entire field altogether. Well, you're getting a little old. You're a junior now. So, yeah, I would think yeah, you should know age some 16, of this. You know, age 16, drug development, not, not a normal thing. <laughs> so, I guess and, we'll forgive you because you didn't know any oh, of this yeah. stuff here. Yeah. Right. I was in ninth grade at the time. Oh, and... okay. All right. Ninth <laughs> grade. <laughs> I'll give you a pass then. Yeah. You know, I was uh, four. Yeah. I, I wasn't, so I, I didn't the quite get this. Ninth would have been like unforgivable, you know? Ninth grade. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Grade, okay. exactly. Yeah. And um, I decided to jump into the science to learn more about it. And the more and more I read, the more fascinated I became. And then ever since then, I teamed up with my dad and started writing papers on this and working with him to do laboratory study. All right, so I gotta stop you. You just say that so casually. So I'm 10, I'm 12, I'm 14. I decided to join in my dad on, in the research. What the heck can you bring at 12 or 14? A, a drawing I get. Hey, can you help me make a drawing? I don't know how to use a computer and do computer animation. You're a kid, you must know how to do this. Sure, dad. But now the research, what can you bring as a junior in high school? Is it, are you just crunching numbers? Are you figuring out a, a pathway to research? I mean, I, walk me through this, because I'm really, I'm sure I'm not the only one saying, what, what can a, a high school kid, I, I would be dismissive, I'm sorry to say, what can a high school kid bring to this? Maybe you could be. I think she's, I think you're writing some of the papers. Yeah, I am. So um, yeah. I believe that learning comes... My head's exploding, but go ahead. That's all right. <laughs> I believe learning comes from doing it yourself and messing up completely. I would prepare papers, but to be honest, they were really bad. They were terrible, right? But then my dad, he was very patient with me, and he walked through how to rearrange it and make it flow. So I, I practiced so many versions of papers. I, I can't even count... And um, I just kept learning and learning and learning and trying again. It, it never came on the first try. And at the beginning, I didn't offer anything, to be honest, right? I just offered a fresh mind who wanted to learn something new. And yeah. a willingness to do this and help right. out your dad. All right, so now when you write it, though, walk me through, Dr. Trin, because I've never written a serious research paper. None of us have. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote papers in high school, I wrote papers in college, and you had to lay out your argument. I get that. Uh, it has to be clear. At one point, has to lead to the next. Mm -hmm. You come to some conclusion here, and it's supported by the facts. You, you make an argument, and you yes. support it with the facts. But do I rely on somebody else to lay out the argument, to come up with the argument? Hey, if you did this, this leads to this, and to make those connections, that's what your dad's doing. He's, he's connecting the dots, and you're what, distilling it into a paper, or are you actually contributing ideas? And he goes, hey, I hadn't thought of that. So um, it was a while back, and yeah, he, he connected the dots, and then I would, and he would explain it to me, and then I would prepare the paper and like draw an outline, and mm -hmm. it was very rough, and he would help me rearrange the, the dots to make it flow better right and now i'm the one writing the paper and writing the outline making it flow nicely and i think my most proud moment is when i write a sentence or two and i show it to my dad and he doesn't edit it at all wow. i consider that a victory for yeah, me. yeah <laughs> right because he's uh, now how was this accepted these are in some sort of peer-reviewed journals or something here are these um, are this is not in just, uh, I don't know, some local paper or something, uh, some local throwaway newspaper or something. These are scientific medical journals, mainstream. Now, wouldn't they reject it because of you and your age? Or do they not, they just carry about, They all they carry about is the argument and the science. Right. They're not interested whether you're 16 or 60. Uh, content. content. They care about the content, not the author. Yeah. And so... Do you find this, are, are you amazed? Are your parents amazed? Are, you, are your friends, are your teachers amazed? I mean, this is, you're contributing to writing uh, serious research at an age when you're not supposed to do any of this. You're supposed to have, that's years from now after you've studied and maybe we'll let you tackle some of this stuff. You're, you're in it rather early here. I believe anyone can do anything at any age, really, if you just put your mind to it and 
like just really invest yourself in any topic right i mean even kids they i know kids who are really smart in physics like at my age and they're already doing uh physics way beyond our age because they have a passion for it so for me writing papers isn't about oh i'm a kid and i'm a genius or something right, I, I, right. i'm nothing like that i'm just out there trying to learn more about medicine and just contributing as best I can uh, to the to the medical knowledge. One of the things that surprised me, uh, we, this is a little uh, off topic, but but I think it, it's appropriate here. We did a show a couple of years ago on um, what it takes to get into college these days. Uh, and it was somebody, I guess they're professional guidance counselors and stuff now, uh, people that help you prepare to get into college. It isn't like my day. You just took an SAT, you took a test, and then you sent in a form, and they said yes or no. And maybe, you know, then they started writing essays, and we never had to do any of that stuff. And then you had to show outside curricular activity, extracurricular activities, and maybe we showed a little of that. But it, mm -hmm. it's become now you got to sell them because er, there are a million kids with straight A's. There are a million kids with good SAT scores. So what sets you apart are the extracurricular activities and the um, extra thought and argument that you make. Uh, and one of the points that they made is these kids are doing amazing things. They're starting charities like Dr. Trin's uh, tongue out type of stuff. They're doing their own research. They're starting their own companies at 16 uh, and doing these things. It's almost like you have to be able to show that you cured cancer to get into Harvard these days. <laughs> you can't just show up and say, I'm really smart and I worked really hard and I got good grades. <laughs> so what do you think of that? Is this, is this a, a, any eye towards that? This, this clearly will open a lot of doors for you going forward to get into medical school. To be honest, when I first went into research, I didn't really think about college. Um, uh, <laughs> well, you're 12 or something. Yeah, right, exactly. I passed college. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I do, I do see at school how extracurriculars really help getting in, but I'm not really doing this for college. I'm just doing this as part of my passion and my career itself because college is only four years of my life, which is a very short time, but I'm yeah. looking past that towards my entire career and what would set me towards my goals uh, in terms of uh, being a physician and going to medical school. All right. I keep challenging you. You're only 16 or 17 or whatever you are here. This shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. And why are you doing this stuff? And you're just like, cause I just love doing this. And why not? I, if I, I give them the chance, I'll jump in with both feet. Same reason yeah. people are starting coming. Look at them. I, I live in a world of media. Oh my goodness. You know, Justin Bieber, the famous Justin Bieber, wasn't he discovered because he was doing YouTube videos in a home here. And all of a sudden it launched a major career. I mean, what kids are being able to accomplish through the internet with the power of the internet at an yes. early age is mind blowing, particularly to people of my era. And, and more than just the publications, I think the most gratifying thing was that uh, Ramatriban, which is the drug we've been working on, yes. had, actually we treated four out of four patients in uh People, patients with severe COVID-19 in India, one of whom is my grandmother. Yes, I remember well, him telling us that story. Right? Oh yeah, tell, tell us that story tell again. Tell us the story again, yeah. All right, so we were able to get Ramatraban shipped from Japan to India. Mm -hmm. My grandmother uh, is living in a central town in India named Indore. She mm -hmm. is 90 years old. Four or five years ago, she actually had a heart attack Mm. And she survived. She also has kidney disease. So she has many of the comorbidities mm -hmm. that make someone um, that we consider to be more prone to more severe disease in COVID right. and unfortunately mortality. When she got COVID-19 um, in April of this year, we were very concerned. She was very weak. She had a very high fever and her oxygen saturation went down to 82 to 84%. She was admitted to the hospital for- And, and is that because again, you're, I'm sorry, I have to just stop you periodically. So you, you mentioned before, why, I hear that all the time that oxygen levels drop and that's when it gets dangerous. And that's when they go into uh, mm -hmm. you know, the hospital and emergency. And if they can't get the oxygen levels up, that's what kills you, right? Uh, it's that 
is that what is the state and is that because of a blood clotting that why does the oxygen level drop and why does that kill you and is that the principal fear of all these COVID things that you're it's going to get in your lungs and suddenly you can't breathe yeah because there's occlusion or um, the blood clotting prevents proper um, oxygen saturation of the blood so that's Mm -hmm. why not enough oxygen is being delivered to the cells and um, that's why there's severe disease. And is that what kills is that the yes. killer effect of COVID? Because I keep hearing people say, oh, my goodness, it went into my lungs and suddenly I can't breathe. And suddenly I'm in on an incu- intubator or whatever, yeah, an intubator. They're tr- forcing me to try and breathe here and they can't. And it just fails and falls off and you die. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, it, it is a major factor in the mortality of many patients. All right, so continue the story. Your grandmother's got all these co- these yep. terrible problems that could lead her to die from this disease. Let's let's be blunt here. The, if if you get COVID, you're you're in that category that probably is going to struggle to survive here because of these other conditions you have here. So, given her comorbidities, she wasn't given a very good prognosis in the hospital, right. and we were very, very concerned. Um, she was given medications like remdesivir and steroids, but unfortunately, these medications were futile, right? Um, and then, hopelessly, she just discharged herself from the hospital to go home. Um, and probably to a, die, right? I, if I'm not yeah. going to make it, then let's just go home and be at peace here. Yeah, exactly. Right. And mm-hmm. she was very weak. She could barely move in bed. Um, but actually a family friend was able to rush over Ramatraban to give to her. After taking a few doses, her oxygen saturation went up to 90%. Wow. And wow. after four weeks of taking the drug, she made a full recovery. All right, so I got to stop you again. Your father uh, told this story as well, and I had the same reaction. Why isn't this front page news? Why isn't this on CNN every single night? I know that's just one anecdotal case, and I know it takes studies and everything, but I think of all the other crazy drugs, and I don't want to go down a political rabbit hole, but there have been lots of them floated on the Internet, most of which were nonsense. I don't know, maybe some of them had some... Uh, help but everybody immediately rushed to find some other drug that was there that might have some accidentally some benefit for this and there were several high profile ones that were presented and mostly dismissed now not among everybody but uh so if you found one that seems to be the real deal why wouldn't drug companies be all over this why wouldn't the news be all over this why wouldn't the presidential task force be all over this why is this why is this something I've not heard anything about? Um, there, there are several several reasons. Uh, the reason why a lot of drug companies are not interested in Ramatraban is because it's a very old drug. Mm. So it is not very profitable since when a new drug is developed, companies, they have patents on it. Right. So Exclusivity part, for the next 20 right. years here, right. But but when the patent expires, anybody can make it, right? Exactly, right. So this drug is already 20 years old. It's not profitable. It's only a couple cents a day, so it's very cost-effective. So that's one of the reasons why um, a lot of companies are not really interested because it's not that profitable. But but I'm still a politician. I'm still a health uh, official. I'm still work for the CDC or something. I'm sorry, Mr. or Mrs. Drug Company, but this is cheap. It's available, and uh, I'm assuming it has very low, um, because it's been around so long, it has very low um, side effects as well, Uh, or does it? I don't know. Right. Uh, Since it's been used for so long, the safety is already established. Right. Uh, But I'm not... I'm not too sure why the government hasn't jumped on it, to be fair. Um, We actually applied to clinical trials administered by the government in multiple countries, but um, they would send us a message that Ramashraban did not rise to the top. So we were... um, (laughs) I I wonder why. why. I I, I have no idea. Like, to to be honest, I really don't know. Maybe because the top is, is bought. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, really, I mean, I'm not trying to make it sound like a conspiratorial show, but sometimes it's just that simple. My late father used to say, the answer is money. Now, what's the question? You know, <laughs> whatever I'd say, he'd say, the answer is money. Now, what, what's the question? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> he used to say that about everything. We're good Irish Catholics. I'd say, why don't they ever let priests marry? Uh, the answer is money. Uh, now, what's the question? You know, uh, whatever, whatever it is, he thought money was the ultimate driver of all these things here from one extreme to the other. All right. So um, here you are, you and your father, you think you've discovered something and you've you tried it on a family member and it had, right. dare I say, miraculous results. Uh, and, uh, and I suspect you've done other sorts of anecdotal studies or maybe even tried to do clinical studies. What's the next step to get people to wake up? Is it to get it into a place like Dr. Trin's where you do medical uh, clinical studies, uh, but then you got to raise the money and do all this stuff. Um, where does that come from? Investors or whatever. Um, or is it simply pounding away and collecting stories and saying, look, the overwhelming anecdotal evidence makes this should rise to the top. What, what are you trying to do to break through that barrier? So we're trying to get funding currently to um, fund clinical trials for this drug. And actually, we were able to administer this drug to three other people just besides my grandmother in India. And I do want to share um, one story in particular okay. that actually um, really su surprised me because we actually had the opportunity to interview this man about his experience with Ramatraban. Okay. So mm -hmm. he's a 33-year-old man living in New Delhi, India. Uh, he got COVID as of April of this year as well. Uh, he, he, he was extremely sick. Um, mm. he, his fever was 106 degrees. Oh. Yeah. And he, his COVID pneumonia was in both lungs. Oh, geez. His disease was so severe that his oxygen went down to 73%. Uh, everything you say says you die uh, at that kind of fever with that kind of infection with that kind of low oxygen level you're, you're not making it right his family tried to get him admitted to the hospital but consider this this was during the covid surge in india yeah. so there was no hospital beds available and there was no oxygen cylinders available either and if there was why waste it on this guy he's going to die anyway i'm sorry to say that but at some point you have to start rationing care when you're under those severe circumstances mm -hmm. his family also tried to get him remdesivir which is the antiviral injection that's the one i was thinking about remdesivir yeah but that costed fifteen hundred dollars that's his whole monthly salary wow in so india. it's not a covered thing in india where your insurance pays for it you have to shell out money right for treatment right. wow yeah right. all right so, so terrible story and and how did they hear about your drug how or is this a family friend or somebody family, family friend so um we actually have friends in india that are that have the drug so they know the um they know his family so they mm -hmm. were able to rush over the drug by uber at midnight when he couldn't breathe he was panicking he couldn't sleep yeah family tried to calm and calm him down but they couldn't so when they rushed over a matraban they gave him after one dose after 25 to 30 minutes he was able to breathe again and he slept soundly until the next morning at 11 o'clock in the morning they tested his oxygen saturation again and this time it was 90 percent wow now this is Anecdotal evidence, this is you telling us of these experiences yeah. of friends and family. Um, mm -hmm. Has nobody done any sort of, is it just the money? Has nobody done any sort of trial in this? The drug companies aren't interested because it's an old drug that they can't patent. Uh, it's a cheap drug, uh, so there's not much profit in it. So let's move on and find something else. Um, what is the barrier? Is it just money at this point in time that's keeping this from being tried on a larger population of people to be honest it's just money just money just we have money. all the cro's we have every everyone lined up every time we present to scientists they are completely um supportive of the concept and they and they really understand i'm really grateful for all the support that we have from um people uh from scientists across the country and even around the world right but 
the only setback that we have is funding. So we'll just do some shout out, uh, Dr. Trin. You got some people with some money or they know how to get money like Steve's on the show here. Isn't Steve the inventor guy here that uh, has come up with other things here? Uh, there. Yeah, Steve, um, can you show us some dough? Yeah, come on. We can do some studies. He's on Facebook watching us. <laughs> Facebook watching us. Come on, Steve. We're doing a we're doing a plea for or others. I, I I'd love to hear from the Steves of the world. What is it you look for to? Uh, and this isn't Steve's specialty. And I understand. I'm putting him on a spot here. But there are people listening, or there are people here at UCI uh, that do medical research, like your father. He's a, a clinical uh, thing. Um, By the way, Steve's responding to us. He says he's very interested. What is the product production time? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> give him some of the, give us some of the details. What is, are there, there must be other barriers. I'm trying to find out what's wrong with this picture here. Um, uh, it's funding. It's funding to do the clinical research. Uh, every clinical trial is not free, right? It, it requires staffing. It requires, you know, hiring folks to, to recruit patients. Um, it requires a team of scientists conducting the studies. So it's really a, a budget. Uh, and, and give it, me an idea. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Dr. Try. I know this is what you do at Irvine Clinical Trials, and this is part of your livelihood and everything here. But give me a ballpark. I don't know. What's it cost to do a clinical study? A hundred thousand? A million? A dollar? I don't know. I have, no, I have no idea what kind of money we're talking about here. Depends on what country you're doing it in, too. <laughs> Does it really? Okay, so, I mean, give me just some range. Somebody, give me some range of what kind of numbers we're talking about here to, to move this I forward. Think, and I think I think for a rematriban study, right, which is the medication we're talking about here, we're, we're looking at, uh, we're not looking at the, the thousands. We're probably looking at the millions. Million, but okay. not like the high, high 100 million. It's probably, I don't know. Is there a ballpark number that, that. Yeah. That do you guys, that? Kate, do you have an, a figure? You, you, if money is the issue, then you must've thought through how much do we need and, and what would it take to move this forward? I think a couple million. My dad mo knows more about the yeah uh, uh, money issue. But um, it's, so it's that much money. It's a couple million yeah. dollars to uh, uh, that somebody has to invest. And then what's the potential? If the drug works, you can't patent it. You can't, uh, cause it's a, a publicly, it's in the public domain. Um, and uh, so what's the upside for the investors? Uh, I, I know it might work. Seems like it has some potential to work, but it, working means somebody's got to produce it. Somebody's got to make a profit from it here. Have you thought through that business model of it or is that the next phase? Um, she's the researcher. I'm trying to ask the business questions here. Okay. <laughs> we found a limit to what she knows. He knows the research, but the money, I don't know. <laughs> no, but you're right. Like, like, in it, like what's in it for an investor, right? Yeah, right. That's the question you want to ask. The business so, model. Right. So for pharma to do this, the farmer's going to say, what is my return on investment? My ROI, because this product is generic right? right it's already out there it's not in the u.s you can't get it in the united states it's, it's in japan as a, an allergy pill right. um so a pharma is looking at this med and say you know i can make a lot more money making a new product that i can patent than a generic medication that i can't make money on so i'm not going to fund the research so that's the problem we we have lots of potentially effective medications out there that can be repurposed right repurpose to treat other conditions whether it's covid or, or something else but because they're generic nobody wants to do it because yeah. the the patent has expired and uh so let's get beyond big pharma and their evil profit greedy things we all have this that story plays out a lot and maybe there's some truth to it or maybe it's overblown but whatever it is uh, if ordinary investors wanted to get involved say okay we're gonna fight because I, I, the only thing that frustrates me is people say, well, big businesses, big something doesn't want to do this. But that's why there's nimble people that are disruptive that come in and say, well, if you wouldn't do it, I'll do it. Nobody wanted to do uh, electric cars till Elon Musk come, came along here. It was too much to invest. And we've, heard, we've invested too much in the gas engine. Why are we going to change horses in the middle of the stream and all that stuff here? There are people that come along and say, I, I know this isn't easy and I know this isn't where you want to go, but it's cheaper it's better it's more effective it does all these things and there are people that'll break through but then there has to be a business model how they're going to 
disrupt yeah. the system. And it seems like that's that- probably the challenge. That's probably the challenge to, to get funding is what is the business model for yeah for somebody to to invest, right? There must be a business what model. Do you think, Kate, any thoughts on that? So uh, originally, we didn't really think of a business model as per se because. Uh, we were trying to depend on government funding so we don't have to pay them back. Right. But since right. the government did not um, yeah. give us funding on the first go, we do have used patents on this drug. So um, in the U.S., we can patent uh, uh, old drugs for a different purpose. Right. So a use patent. It it's a you're going to use it. It's a, it's it's never been used for this, and we can patent its use in this. Right. Right. But we even told the government that we will give them a license um, free um, right to the patent. So basically, they don't have to pay us back any royalty, royalty free um, use of the drug because we really believe that this drug could benefit many people. But I'm not but I'm not saying this is the treatment for COVID because we okay. have to verify yeah. uh, the study. through the through studies, through clinical trials. But I really believe that if um, the government is willing to take it, like we're happy to do a royalty free license. Any other doctors coming on board? You've, you've published peer review things. Are people other lining up and saying, hey, this sounds promising? Because I would think that, uh, let's say the CDC, I don't know exactly how the Center for Disease Control works uh, and what their role is in all of this, other than alerting people to the problems and maybe funding some sorts of research. I don't know if that's the entity that would fund research into this. Uh, or give you money to pursue something. But that's the that's the tip of the spear that we always hear, the Center for Disease Control. They're on the ground. They're trying to figure out where it is and alert public health officials and, and find ways to control. If this was Ebola ripping through the country, we'd be teaching a lot differently. If 99% of people were bleeding to death out of every opening in their body, like Ebola, we would suddenly be paying a different attention to this. But because it has too many people think it's just a severe flu that can kill old people with other conditions. Ah, who cares? Um, that may be my uh, old guy viewpoint here. But if this was ripping through children, I think we'd have a different priority than if it was ripping through people uh, my age and older here. Having said that, what would move the CDC's mind? Do they need more Dr. Trins? Do they need more researchers calling up and saying, hey, really look at this. They're, they're onto something. This, this has promise, this has potential. Because yeah. they're not worried about the profitability of it. They're worried about the, the, the success rate. Or they only got, as I've read before, they've only got so much, as big as the federal government is, right. it's a machine and when they move it in one direction, they can't do, they're not very nimble. They can't do 20 things at once here. And they do have a limited amount of attention more than money. Where can we focus our attention and where are we going to get the biggest bang for our result here? And if we go down this path and ignore this, then are we putting ourselves two years down the road? We've wasted a couple of years here. So they're trying to guess what's the best one to bet on here. Mm -hmm, right. The horse race is taking um, off and there's a bunch of horses and I got to put my money somewhere here. How do they... Side, I'm, what's sitting the here, I'm sitting here looking at uh, clinical trials that are coming out on COVID treatment with uh, with smaller pharma organizations, uh, not the big, you know, Eli Lilly or, you know, the Novartis and Biogen. Right. The, the smaller pharma, even if they have great, great data, uh, there's often a higher barrier to get attention. Yes, that's right. Because that's an the, attention issue. Small. <clears throat> and how do you get people know. to pay attention right yes yes and so so that's really been the issue it's like hey we have something here but you're like and they're the fda is talking to the big guys they they don't see the small guys and so because well, if i'm gonna bet on a horse i'm gonna bet on the horse that's the favorite and that's already won it's got big money big research we got to do something big am i gonna bet on you know paul and his idea probably not because I just don't, how do I, how does Paul even break through the noise? How do you break through the noise? Right, uh, you're right. Because really all this started was in the garage, two of us doing research. And I, right. I am really grateful for the support that we have from many scientists around the world and professors who do support the concept. But um, as Dr. Trin mentioned, we are very small compared to a lot of these well-known pharma companies. Yeah, right. That isn't to dismiss that you don't know what you're doing. There's lots of people. Edison didn't know what he's doing when he was tinkering with a light bulb in the back of his 
wherever he was, the garage or something here, endlessly running through filaments trying to see which one wouldn't burn out. I mean, we uh, it, uh, HP started in a garage, Amazon started in a garage. We, we, we accept the idea that small ideas can come from the most unlikely places here. But then how do you get people to rally behind it, start throwing money at it, and start throwing attention at it? That seems to be the challenge here. We lost Dr. Trin for some yeah. reason here. He got knocked out. The, 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 uh, the, the government just shut us down. No. Uh, <laughs> they're stopping this discussion right now here. There's going to be a black screen that will come up. Um, uh, so uh, I, I get what you're saying, and I'm, I'm grateful that we can tell a handful of people or a bunch of people here. Um, he says he lost his Internet connection. We'll see if oh, he can no. find his way back on here. Uh, there are people in this community and I, I'm kiddingly pointing out Steve here, but there are people like this who, who are entrepreneurs, who, who are used to being disruptive. Uh, uh, there are lots of disruptors here at UCI at the Applied Innovation Center. Uh, there are, we're all looking for disruptors these days. Uh, there is a community of disruptors uh, in the world now here, and, and they are looking for ways to do something different. Um, so I think I would focus less on the government and trying to get them to wake up and bang their bang on the door when they're not listening you're right. not big enough you're not well funded enough there isn't enough study to, to open their eyes uh, there's just really fascinating strong anecdotal evidence personal evidence that you guys have tried i wonder if a private path isn't a more productive way for you to go here uh we'll find out dr trend's coming back in mm -hmm. um and I do recognize that the government has done um, a lot of good things for COVID, like the development of vaccines and antiviral agents. Yeah, that's but, where they're putting their money. Yeah, but the only problem is that um, it takes a long time to develop. So we need like drugs like Ramatriban that will that would boost the immune system against the virus and help people fight it off, buying time for the development of these vaccines and antiviral agents. Have you ever, Dr. Chin seems to find these. He's a disruptor. What was the other guy you've had on a couple of times here? Offend. I think you've actually joined the board of their organization here. Uh, and it's a similar, it's a treatment. It's not a prevention. It's not going to kill COVID, but it keeps it in the upper respiratory system as she's talking about. He's using a drug. He's using it's a kind of saline. It's a it's a uh, solution to try and uh, uh, and keep the mucus strong, and it'll flush it out before it finds its yeah. way down into it's, your lungs. Here, it's actually uh, very interesting. Um, this product called Fen, uh, F E N D, uh, discovered by uh, Dr. David Edwards of Harvard. Uh, he's uh, become a friend of mine now. I was just out there. What two weeks ago, I think. Yeah. Right. Uh, on Harvard, uh, meeting with their board um, uh, and um, part of the the team over there, but uh, it also protects the airway, uh, just kind of like Ramatriban protects the the airway here with interferon. This this is actually the product here, and it's got a little uh, salt solution here, and what it does is that it hydrates your airway to protect and coat the, the cilia uh, in the larynx throat area to to push everything back up uh, when viruses come on. More, so more mucus, is, more cil more robust. Your, yeah. the, you can flush yeah. this. Your body will flush it out before it gets in and into your lungs yes. and starts clotting. So, and, yeah. so you just inhale it. It's a little mist. Watch. I don't know if you see the mist. See it? Oh, yeah. You just inhale it. It's like a little drug, except it's not a drug. <laughs> and you've and and the what's the beauty of this is it's something you can carry around, a little battery powered thing. And it's more than just a saline solution. They've tried to figure out in very serious ways what what will help coach your upper respiratory and create the most mucus, I guess, to keep this from it's yeah. It doesn't create mucus. What it does is that it, it hydrates your airway. And airway hydration and humidity protects the airway against uh, pollution, against toxins that come in, and against viruses. Um, and so there's, they've done some good data uh, studies on this in other countries uh, and some COVID studies on this product as well. And it's just really uh, hydrating your airway. 
right. with good results. With a particular uh, proprietary yeah. blend of saline solution and other things here that to, uh, to reach the most efficacy here. So there's a little treatment that that isn't specifically designed for COVID, but could be designed for any sort of outside pollutant or anything entering. And kind of what you're talking about your drug, it sounds like your drug is there to create antibodies to fight it before it goes any further. Uh, this is sort of using whatever you described there, uh, your airways, mo natural moisture to flush stuff out or to keep it from going further into your body here. If I'm describing both of these correctly. I'm sort of trying to figure this. I'm, I'm not a 16 year old genius here or a, uh, <laughs> or on the board of 14 things. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. There are things out there that can keep this from going further into your body. That seems to be the key. If you can keep it contained, then it is a head cold. It is a flu. It, it doesn't kill you. But when it moves from here into your lower lungs, that's when death can occur or serious disease and, can occur. And I think that's what's behind the, the idea of Ramatriban. It's, it's not necessarily COVID specific, but it strengthens your body's defenses. It strengthens your body's immune system to, to fight the viruses when they come. And, uh, and not only does it that, but it blocks, it blocks uh, pro-clotting factors right. in the sense that, um, you know, COVID is a clotting problem. Uh, COVID, because of the inflammation that, that comes from this infection, it increases the body's uh, clots, blood clots. And those blood clots, if they're in the lungs, it causes pulmonary embolus. If it's in the brain, it causes strokes. Uh, if it's in the coronary vessels, it causes heart attacks. This is why there's so much correlation between having a COVID infection and heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots. Right. And, and Romatriban has a pathway of, uh, of blocking uh, uh, blood clots, which is a very interesting uh, product that, that boosts the interferon uh, defenses and also blocks uh, blood clot. And so it addresses COVID in that way. So here's my last okay. question as we wrap up. Um, yeah. First of all, wow. You know, again, anybody who thinks the new generation is a bunch of slackers and hackers and uh, couch potatoes uh, playing video games, uh, watch this show and meet people like Kate. Uh, I'm very impressed. I, I think everybody is on here. One of the comments was, why do you, why, why do you even bother with college? Just, why don't you just send you straight to grad school here? You know, you seem to be ready to launch into the world here. Um, so congratulations on that uh, everything. Now, the bigger question of, of treatments to prevent or keep COVID, not to kill it. That's what the, the other drugs are trying to do. We're trying to find ways to kill it so that it goes away. But in the absence of it going away, if it's gonna keep hanging around because not enough people get vaccinated or, 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 or it keeps breeding and morphing like the flu and finding hosts to keep changing. If this is something we're going to deal with for some time to come, we got three choices. One, we can all just roll the dice and get sick and hope we don't die, which is a scary alternative. But there have been people who have emphasized it. In the beginning, there was like, it was like the chicken pox. Uh, people would say, let's have a party and let's just all get it over with and we'll all get sick and then we'll be uh, immune to this thing here. Well, maybe it doesn't give you forever immunity and maybe you don't make it through that uh, uh, experience. Yeah. So that's a little scary. And if you do, maybe you'll give it to everybody else. All right, that's one alternative. Let's all just get it over with and get it. The other alternative is let's live our lives in fear, shut down, isolated, mass, uh, working from home, uh, constant shutdowns, uh, everything else. And uh, the public's already weighed in on that one. We're not going there. We'd much rather just all take the risk. And more and more, I don't think there's an appetite for shutdowns, slowdowns, even wearing masks forever, all that stuff that mm -hmm. I, I think. So then the third alternative is we've got to find a way to deal with it. And we've got to find a way to keep moving and keep going. Yes, maybe we'll wear a mask uh, as much as we don't want to on airplanes and public spaces. I think that's going to happen whether we like it or not. Yes, we're going to force people to get inoculations. If you want to come into a theater, you want to come into a restaurant, you want to get on an airplane, you want to work with a group of people. I know you don't want to and nobody wants to tell you what to do. Then fine, then don't come here. 
you know, no shirt, no shoes, no service. We're, we're going to, I think bus- it's not going to be government's going to force people to do this. It's going to be businesses to say enough of this nonsense. I don't want to get people sick. I don't want to lose employees. And I don't want to um, have anybody have any hesitation in coming here. All right. So that's one way to deal with it. The other are what you're talking about. Treatments, things we can do. I'm going to fend. I'm going to, everybody's going to carry a little thing to uh, uh, hydrate your airways. Everybody's going to take drugs like, I don't even know if I can say it, remdesivan or whatever, whatever you said, call it. Retrofan. Okay. Um, uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to take things to boost our immune system, to uh, add to our interferon, interferers, the, the defenders of the castle. We're going to flush it out. We're going to contain it. We're going to block it. We're going to stop transmission. We're going to come up with lots of strategies that we can go about our daily lives, not in fear of infection anymore here. We're going to find a way to, or, or, or if you do get it, to, to get rid of it quickly and to contain it so it doesn't spread to your body. Because when it spreads, you can die. Uh, and that's what is different about this one. Yes, a flu can do that. Anything can do this. But this does it a lot lot nastier, a lot worse uh, thing if it moves. So I would think that there would be, uh, there's going to be a lot of impulse to find treatments going forward, not just ways to kill it but ways to deal with it so that we can keep living. What do you think of that, Dr. Trim? Absolutely. There's, um, there's treatment, there's prevention, and there's uh, living with it. strategies to boost your immune system and your immune system's defense. Yeah. Uh, so To so help your body fight this thing off and prevent it oh, from yeah. getting into something serious. And this seems to fall into that category. So don't give up. Yes. I think you're in the next wave. I think we've all been looking for the magic bullet. And I think that's where the research and the effort's been to inoculate, to kill, to wipe it out. And in the absence of that working, it's worked somewhat largely, more than we than maybe we give credit right. for. But we're going to have to learn to deal with this, and we're going to go into phase two, which is then i got to find ways to boost my vitamin C, to boost my defenses, to boost my interferon, to prevent my yeah. thing from clotting, to all this stuff. And both, both Kate and Dad is leading the charge. Yeah, right. I think you're and, in charge. Uh, I think you're in the next phase. I think you're a little early. I think you said we got something that can maybe knock it out when you get it, and we were – focused more on let's just kill it. We're trying to come up with uh, inoculations. We're trying to come up with vaccines. We're trying to come up with ways so nobody gets this. And we've only gotten so far with that. Now it's clear this isn't going away. It's morphing too quickly. Uh, There's too many people that aren't inoculated or aren't going to get inoculated. And that's going to allow it to keep mutating and breeding. So how do we deal with it? How do we handle it? Yeah. Kate, what else, what else would you like to tell us that we haven't already discussed? Right. Any, any other thoughts you have? And, about and how do people get in touch with you? Cause we already got people like Steve saying, Hey, I want to, I want to learn more about this now. Here. So we've, we've yeah, sparked a little uh, interest today here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that uh, we can really just take away um, from this pandemic and in future pandemics as well, that we should really be um using and repurposing drugs for certain viral infections, uh, especially uh, to boost the immune response, because um, since vaccines and antiviral agents take a very long time to develop, we need to prevent the deaths of, of millions of people that have died. So by doing this, we can boost the immune response. And because only now are we seeing a um, antiviral for COVID developed by Pfizer. Right after millions of people have already died. So if we can just repurpose drugs, which is more cost effective to mm-hmm. help boost the immune system, then we can pre- prevent these deaths before the vaccines come out. And, and I would only add to that, it sounds like just me sitting on the sideline here, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Trin, then somebody's got to come up with a business model that makes sense for that. Because the drug companies say, I hear what you're saying. There might be drugs out there we could use, but I'm in a business. I can't go. This isn't a charity. I can't do this for free, even if it's effective. And the government, for whatever reason, is this the government's role? They need to step in and just buy up tons of these drugs and distribute them because nobody else will. 
Is this, and then we get to, well, then it's big government telling me what to do. And I don't like that idea either. If, if it's not big farm or big government, who's the big deep pocket that's going to make and make sense of this and do something with it? What do you think, Dr. Trent? Money. We're down to money. We're dying because of, of fighting over money. Isn't that sad? Yeah. And I just, I can get mad about it or I can say then somebody's got to figure out an answer to that. Somebody's got to, is this a public welfare program that government buys and distributes without any hope of profit here because yeah. it's in the public good or is that not the right model and there's somebody else that can come up with a way to take this and repurpose it and come up with use patents and other ways to uh, uh, to be more nimble and to still make money and to still profitably produce and distribute this thing so that we encourage capitalism what it's supposed to do is go find an answer when nobody else can. Right. Kate, how do we reach uh, your organization or how do we reach you or dad? Yeah. Is there a website or an email when people are interested in this? Uh, so we have a, we actually created a company around this called Care Bio, uh, mm. Care Biosciences. So, but it's Care with a K. Okay. Got it. Uh, it's carebio.com. And, and do you have uh, a, a pitch deck? Do you have a do you have a way for people to invest in this? Have you gone that far? Or are you still looking for that kind of help to come up with business plans and and an investment? Uh, I don't know. You need to have a whole legal structure for people to invest and to do things too. You got to have all that in place, not just a plan, but you have to have a uh, an approved private offering and all these kinds of things. Uh, my we, we have a pitch deck so um, on the website we um, have the email that uh, where people can contact us and uh, my dad has a pitch deck so he can present all the financial details of this and um, uh, other information carebio.com is that right yeah so k a r e b i o dot com mm -hmm. Well, it must be frustrating to feel like you found an answer and nobody's listening. Uh, yeah. We're appreciative that you uh, will do what we can through our uh, local voice and our local community. And who knows where this could lead to. But I think you've got to start shifting your mindset. It, somebody's got to just step up and say, is this the government's role then to take old drugs and to use them on the public good? And this is just something we pay for. That's why they're, we collectively pay taxes and have a government. Or is this something the private industry can, a, a nimbler organization can step up when the big guys can't or won't or don't because it's too expensive and they're too committed to some other course of action that they think will make them more money? Because there's always an opportunity. Opportunity is what investors are looking for. Show me where n nobody else is going and I'm interested. And you're going somewhere with some real interesting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stories and facts of a drug that's already available. And do you th are there others? There must be other drugs. There's millions of drugs out there. There must be other ones that people haven't investigated yeah. and looked at. This could be a oh, whole yes. new strategy. Yeah. Well. Oh, Kate, what do you think of the metaverse? The metaverse? <laughs> this is Dr. Trin's fascination. If, if don't live in the real universe, live in the metaverse and you are all going to go on and we'll put a little, uh, this, these little fake worlds we're going to go live in second life or whatever. And we're all going to uh, do communicate oh, yeah. with each other and ro yeah. my little grandson's in Roblox. You know, you build these little private uh, worlds and invite everybody to come. Metaverse in. is coming, Kate. You got to be, you got to lead the charge, Kate. Yeah. The metaverse. So he's open. Their company's actually opening up physical locations in the metaverse, so you can come and buy stuff using this little fake Bitcoin kind of currency that people. Oh yeah. To. It's so if the real were yeah a metaverse pharma. That's what Steve says. We're gonna have if the real universe, if the real world ain't paying attention, then go into the metaverse. They're open to everything here. I think. <laughs> It'd be cool if we could simulate conditions and give them treatments and actually get like a definitive um, result. Then mm. we could actually even like just simulate clinical trials and then see like and then actually mm. get results from those. And if if it's possible, I mean that would be amazing. See, Doctor Tring, you were laughing, but she's already come up with a real use for this. It's not just to sell it; it's to do virtual trials. We're going to virtually virtual infect clinical people. Clinical trials with. 
with Kate Chang in the metaverse. Yeah. I like that. We're going to chat about that, Kate. Virtual clinical trials in the metaverse. There you go. If that's really gonna, possible, why not? You're going to be the lead for that. That'd yeah. be awesome. She'll be on the cover of Time magazine. We don't need to do physical trials. We do virtual trials in the yeah. metaverse here. And that's somehow right. we get good data back and everything here. That's right. Let's build that. That's awesome. You. You're in charge. <laughs> All right. Well, fascinating discussion from a fascinating young woman who's just casually telling us, uh, yeah, I'm working to solve uh, for uh, COVID treatments. My dad and I, and I'm writing papers and we're doing research and everything. What do you do all day? I mean, do you just crunch numbers? Do you look at other, search the internet for other studies and examples? Are you, are you doing, you're not doing any research right now on this other than just here and there trying it on people, but what what do you do f to research this thing? What does Kate do every day on this project? Um, most days I'm at school, to be honest. At school? <laughs> There's no time for that. Oh, yeah. Call her oh, out. Yeah. She's, she's got to finish high school English. And, you know, yeah, what you a know. waste. Get out of that. Yeah. Drop your history oh, class. Wow. Let's go cool. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Homework. Wow. Yeah, right. Do you ever look at yourself and say, why am I doing this silly homework on this? I could be solving cool. the world's problems, but no, I've got to figure out, I got to write a paper on, uh, you know, <laughs> George oh, Washington. Yeah, yeah exactly. I still, do learn, I, I still do learn a lot from school and I think that it keeps me grounded. It just keeps me grounded in school. And, um, also like, I, I really believe like, um, I learned how to walk before I fly. So um, school is like learning how to walk. Right? I don't know. Yeah. You're flying pretty high already here, much uh, higher than I was. You're running, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Keep coming back and keep reminding us as you reach milestones, as you, you know, we'll, we'll be a voice for this. As, yes. as I like Fend and all these other things, because I really do think that's the next thing. We're going to have to learn to live with this. And that means we're going to have to have treatments that boost our immune system, boost our interferon, boost our hydration. And we're going to do everything possible so that we can go back to living with this thing because it ain't going away. That's clear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, neither Great. we. We're not going away. Dr. Trum, we're off next week for all those listening. Yeah. That's our one week down between Christmas and New Year's. So just have a wonderful holiday and see us back in January. Any uh, upcoming hints? What are we going to see? And you come up with these people, Dr. Trend, Fend, and these guys and stuff. What, where, how do you find them all? Are you just searching the internet for this stuff all the time here? Uh, I don't know. Word of mouth. Sometimes somebody just, says, hey, listen to this. They're, they're just conversations I have with people. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm like, that's a cool conversation. Why don't you come on the show? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Well, I hope uh, you got Steve's interest this morning. He's certainly somebody who's raised money and knows how to do things. Uh, yeah, I'm going to connect you with some folks, Kate, you and Dad. Thank you. And we'll yes. see if we can make, turn this conversation into, into some sort of reality. Uh, we don't want to just live in the endlessly in the metaverse and pretend. We want to get stuff really done here. So, All right. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for a great year, Dr. Trin. We'll see you next uh, year. We'll see you in a week in 2022 as we relaunch and yes. uh, season the next season of Health Talks with Dr. Trin. Bye. One more reason why you should tune in each and every week and tell your friends too. As we take a look at how well, we have talks, conversations, about topics on everybody's mind. Throw out some ideas, good or bad. We're talking about it. We hope you'll join us right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. Streaming live from the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.